Welcome to the Deep Dive. Today, we're really getting into the weeds on minoxidil. It's, uh, it's one of those medications, you know, that has just an absolutely wild origin story. Mm -hmm. And now it's, well, it's basically a household name if you're dealing with hair loss. Yeah. Just imagine this. You're trying to cure ulcers, right? Yeah. And you accidentally find something that tackles like really severe high blood pressure. And then completely by chance, you discover its secret superpower is hair growth. Exactly. That's minoxidil's path. It's just a perfect case of uh, pharmacological serendipity, as you said. It really is. It's quite the journey. So it started back in the late 50s. They were aiming for ulcer treatments, but, well, that didn't pan out. Okay. But then they realized it was this incredibly potent vasodilator. Strong enough for what we call refractory hypertension. That's blood pressure so high, nothing else is touching it. Wow. It was sold as Lonitin. But the thing everyone noticed, the really consistent uh, side effect, hair growth. Not just on the head, right? Oh, no. Often all over. Hypertrichosis, it's called. And that observation, that unexpected effect, is what led to it being completely repurposed. Into the topical stuff we know now, like regain or rogain. Precisely. So that's our mission for this deep dive. Okay. Let's unpack the science behind how this happened and, you know, how minoxidil actually works on hair. Because I think, as we'll find out, it's way more sophisticated than just like a grow hair pill. Definitely. To really get it, though, we probably need a quick reminder about the hair growth cycle itself. Good point. It's essentially this cycle, this rhythm between a long growth phase that's called anagen and then a shorter resting phase, telogen. Right. Now, in common hair loss, androgenetic, alopecia, or AGA, what happens is that growth phase, the yeah. anagen phase, it gets shorter and shorter, and that leads to the follicle shrinking. We call it follicular miniaturization. The hairs just get thinner and weaker over time. Okay, so the growth window closes too soon. Exactly. And here's where minoxidil gets really interesting, scientifically speaking. It's not actually active right out of the bottle. Oh. No, it's what we call a prodrug. Your body has to convert it. Specifically, an enzyme called salty one a one which is right there in the hair follicle's outer root sheath, needs to change it into its active form, minoxidil sulfate. salty one a one Okay. And this step, this conversion, it's absolutely crucial. It actually explains why some people, you know, they try the topical stuff and don't see much result. Ah, so they might just not have enough of that enzyme activity right there on their scalp. Precisely. They might have lower levels of salty 1A1 in their follicles. For those individuals, um, sometimes low-dose oral minoxidil works better. Because it bypasses that local step. Yeah. The liver has plenty of the enzyme needed for conversion, so taking it orally gets the active form into the system regardless of scalp enzyme levels. Wow. Okay. So it's not just about getting more blood flow to the scalp then. I feel okay. like that was the original idea, wasn't it? Because it's a vasodilator? Right. That was yeah. the early thinking. And vasodilation, the increased blood flow, it probably is a factor. It helps, you know, bringing nutrients and oxygen. Sure. But it's definitely not the main event. The primary action seems to be directly on the hair cycle itself. Okay, how so? Well, minoxidil actually shortens that resting phase, the telogen phase. It basically nudges follicles out of rest and forces them into the growth or antigen phase sooner. Ah, that explains the shedding some people get at the start. Exactly. That initial minoxidil shed can be alarming, but it's often a positive sign. It means the drug is working, pushing out the old resting hairs to make way for new active ones. It's like it's hitting reset on the cycle. Okay, resetting the cycle. Yeah. But it does more than just kickstart growth, right? Yeah. You mentioned the phase gets shorter in AGA. Right. And crucially, minoxidil also seems to prolong the antigen phase once it starts. So hairs grow for longer before they rest and shed. So it pushes them into growth and keeps them there longer. Yes. That helps reverse that miniaturization process we talked about, leading to thicker, more robust hairs over time. Yeah, that makes sense. It's like a two-pronged approach to fixing the cycle timing. And you mentioned uh, deeper cellular stuff happening, too. Oh, yeah. It gets really complex down at the cellular level. It seems to trigger a whole cascade of signals. Like what? Well, it's known to boost growth factors, things like VEGF. That's vascular endothelial growth factor. Okay, VEGF, more blood vessels. Yep promotes new blood vessel formation around the follicle. It also stimulates things called prostaglandins, which are also linked to promoting hair growth. Mm. And it activates a really important pathway called the one tech catenin pathway. You can think of that as like a master controller involved in regenerating follicles from stem cells. Wow. 
Okay, that's pretty fundamental. It is. And even more recently, there's emerging evidence, really interesting stuff, suggesting it has anti-inflammatory effects too. Yeah. And quite surprisingly, potentially direct anti-androgenic properties. Anti-androgenic, like fighting the hormones involved in typical hair loss? Exactly. Some studies suggest it might actually reduce the expression of androgen receptors in the follicle or even affect how androgens are synthesized locally. That gets it closer to tackling the hormonal root cause of AGA, which is something we didn't really associate with minoxidil before. So it's doing way more than just opening blood vessels or tweaking the cycle timing. It's interacting on multiple levels. It really seems to be a multi-target approach, even if we didn't design it that way initially. Okay, so bringing this back to practical use, for yeah. you listening, what are the key takeaways here? Well, clinically, the 5% topical solution generally shows better results than the older 2% version. Right. And as we discussed, low-dose oral minoxidil is definitely a growing and effective alternative, especially for those who don't respond well topically or find the topicals inconvenient. But consistency is vital. Yeah. Oh, absolutely critical. You have to keep using it. The benefits are maintained only with continuous treatment. If you stop, the hair loss will likely resume. And side effects. People worry about irritation. Yeah. Local scalp irritation is probably the most common one with topicals. That's often due to the propylene glycol in the liquid solution. Switching to a foam formulation, which usually doesn't have PG, can help a lot of people. Okay. And then there's the systemic effect we mentioned earlier, that potential for unwanted hair growth elsewhere, hypertrichosis. It's less common with topical use than oral, but it can happen. It just reminds you this is a potent medication affecting hair growth biology. Definitely. So to wrap up, Minoxidil's success isn't down to one simple thing. Not at all. It's this multifaceted attack, isn't it? It's resetting the hair cycle. It's boosting key growth factors, maybe reducing inflammation, and potentially even having these surprising anti-androgenic effects. It's a biological multitasker. A real workhorse molecule with a fascinating story, which leads to a final thought, maybe. Given how complex its action is and how much individual response varies, especially with that SLT101 enzyme factor, mm -hmm. What does this tell us about the future? Could we see truly personalized medicine for something like hair loss, tailoring treatments based on someone's specific biology? Hmm. That's the big question, isn't it? Something for you to ponder. That's all for this deep dive.